is that this caucus last year passed a fully funded prospective budget going forward in the out years. And at some point, if the other body won't do that, there are needs that are unmet, and we have to move forward. The world keeps spinning. We have to move forward. And we can't just always uh, hold the line when people are hurt. And that's what 339 uh, aims to avoid. And let me add that uh, House Bill 287 was an attempt to get out of here quicker. You know, we were stuck down here to June 22nd. This is after the House passed everything over to the Senate within 90 days. And then when it came to be 120 days, 121 days, you know, seeing that the Senate was still plugged up on their side, we took the capital budget, put the operating budget, and sent it back over there and trying to get out of here, because that's our constitutional obligation is to be done um, uh, on the operating budget and our budgets. And so when you look at uh, education, we looked at the, the, the lowest common denominator. What can we all agree on? We can at least all agree on funding that we had last year. And so let's get that out of the way and get that done. And then if we, you know, with House Bill 339, we're having a discussion, shall we do more? But right now, let's just do this. And we sent that over to them February 7th. And uh, that's within three weeks of session starting. And now it's been a month that they've had it, and um, um, we're looking forward to a floor vote and, and uh, getting that back over to us. So at least we can take that component off the table, not having to create anxiety for our teachers and for our education systems, and uh, allow us to move forward with the other things more smoothly. And I, I would just like to add that, you know, there was some movement on the Senate side, because this year they said, they would agree not to cut funding. Last year, they wanted to cut 700 teachers across the state. That was what that $69 million would have re resulted in. Uh, they wanted to cut 5% out of the budget, the school budget. Uh, you know, that's the effect, 700 teachers. They have revised that opinion to saying that, yes, they agree that we really can't cut K-12 education. Um, so we thought we had some pretty good agreement movement. We had uh, agreement there were only three votes against that bill passing over to the Senate. Um, uh, hopefully there will be more movement on that um, from the Senate side and we'll get it back and be able to concur with um, uh, what they're working on or at least start talking together in a conference committee. Hopefully we won't need a conference committee on it at all. Um, but, but it's really important, uh, we feel, to getting early funding of education uh, done. Whether there's other discussion on do we need more funding for education, that's, you know, that may be uh, an area of disagreement uh, between us and the Senate. But at least our information was that the, there wasn't disagreement that, we weren't, that they weren't going to offer a cut to K-12 education this year. So let's get it done and get some cooperation and, and move forward. Uh, Steve Quinn, KTVA News. <clears throat> I guess this is more for Representative Seaton. What, um, what differences do you anticipate uh, on the budget with the Senate? And are you starting to work on any of those now? Um, like specific things, whether it's the um, additional million for the prosecutors. I'm sorry, I don't I might have that some correct, but um, uh, I think you uh, added money for fish and game, things like that. Um, sure, uh, we won't know until the budget gets over there and they uh, talk to us. We added um, about a million dollars to fish and game budget, but those were strictly targeted at uh, things that would allow additional harvest uh, because what's happening now is we've cut back on surveys, cut back on stream watches, so that fish and game has to restrict harvest to be very conservative. So we're losing the economy of the state by the cuts that have been made to fish and game. So there were um, Western Alaska, there was Central Region, there was Southeast, there were um, some components in all of those areas across the state where we can improve the economy. And so um, not only that, that brings us greater tax returns because three to 5% of all the value of the fish that are caught come back to the state in taxes. Now, we don't get to keep all that because we share with the municipalities uh, half of that money, but still it is the, the generator of the economies in much, much of the state. So um, the pros uh, it wasn't prosecutors, we've added prosecutors that it was in the governor's budget. <coughs> the um, 
public safety action plan, but there was going to be a bottleneck, and that was in the public defenders. Public defenders um, have to be there for people that can't afford uh, adequate attorneys, defense attorneys, and that's a constitutional requirement. So if we put a bottleneck in the system so that public safety isn't promoted, um, that that's what we're curing with the uh, four n other additional um, intermediate level of um, uh, public defenders, and so makes the public safety system work completely. James Brooks from the Juno Empire. For the resources chairs and Representative Seaton, where does the governor's oil and gas tax credit repayment idea sit in your minds right now? We're going to give that bill consideration at a future time, and we're focusing on the budget right now, and I think, you know, there's, there's big picture thinking going on, and that's part of the big picture, I think, in terms of, um, of, of whether that is something that should happen this session. But I expect we'll have hearings on it in the near future. I mean, that is part of the budget. I mean, if, if, if it doesn't pass, then you do have to pay for it some other way, right? So we have a statutory obligation this year of $49 million, and that's currently included in the operating budget in the House Finance Committee. So there's the statutory obligation being met via that vehicle, and then we'll consider the other legislation. And that interpretation is different from the one that the administration has, the, the minimum. Um, and, and I'll just address that. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, on the tax credit, um, p uh, borrowing money to pay that off, uh, you've got to realize that the idea there was, oh, we'll only pay interest for a couple of years, and then there'll be a bigger payment in the future. Um, so we're, we're kind of worried about that idea of kicking things down the road, uh, obligations, and then putting them on future legislatures when we don't know what the budget's going to be. We've got a real problem with having uh, a few years from now when... If the Senate isn't going to pass any diversification of our revenues, it means that we're going to be really tight in the future when these larger obligations and firm obligations, repaying bonds, would come online. So that's a, that's a, a big consideration. The other question was, what's revenue? Revenue is money we receive, and that's what the statute says. We pay 10 to 15 percent of the revenue we receive um, to the fund, the 028 fund, which then pays these tax credits. And the way it currently is, um, the application of that, the way the administration has it, we would be paying over 60% of all the production tax we receive this year in um, production tax credits, so that in paying off those credits. That's not what was presented when um, uh, Governor Palin was here and when, when um, Governor Parnell were here that we will be paying 10 or 15 percent of the money we receive from production tax to pay the credits. That was the minimum. And the interpretation that it's a, oh, it's what the tax rate is, not what we receive. Because that's not revenue. Revenue is what you receive. So the plain reading of the statute is that we pay this 10 or 15 percent of the <coughs> revenue that's money the state gets. And we don't get that money if it's, oh, what would the tax calculation before you subtract these tax credits that the individual oil companies have? So uh, I think that people need to read the statute and say, what is the definition of revenue? And we know it's what we receive, and that's the uh, obligation that we've put in the budget. And um, so we, we are not taking and putting in the budget $27 million, which is for a bill that would have to pass. Uh, just like other things, we're, those would be in a fiscal note if we pass that bill. Additional questions? <clears throat> uh, Tim Bradner, Legislative Digest. I guess this is for Representative Josephson and, and Tar. Uh, six hours on Pebble, uh, are there any um, plans for legislation? Do you, do you think state agencies have the tools they need to supervise the, uh, the project? Um, y you know, first of all, there is a bill. It's House Bill 14, which I've gotten out of the Fisheries Committee. Uh, I'm still sort of toying with how to proceed with that bill, and the, the committee might hear that bill. 
Um, Tim, I have concerns about whether the department has the resources to monitor the mine site. I, I do. Very grave concerns. In fact, I think that uh, we heard in February of 2017, and we, it was sort of repeated this year, that while the department has been out there 55 times, it doesn't mean that they visited all 1,500 bore, uh, well sites or, or borehole sites. And so uh, I have real concerns when I've seen what those sites look like, and, and I have, at least photographically. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, and I also think that the fact that the commissioner took a, a fairly bold step and said, we are going to require, under existing authority, uh, the partnership to post a greater exploratory bond than typically required was a, a prudent move, but also a reflection of some concern by the department. So I, I, I have some concerns. Well, and I would just add to that that additionally, in terms of resources, one thing that they don't have is all the information that they need. And what we've seen is the Pebble par Partnership has put their application forward to the feds, which would presume to include things about their economics and, and the new um, smaller footprint plan, but the state may not have access to all of that information to do their evaluation. So, you know, one of the things we'd like to see is them reach out and, and be able to get some of the information that's included in that federal application so that they are better informed. Uh, just a <coughs> another bill, it's, I realize uh, it's in the Fisheries Committee, but I think you're a co-sponsor. Representative Josephson is the uh, House Bill 199, the Habitat Bill. Uh, is any plans for hearings? Are you aware on that bill? Well, first of all, you know, w we see that bill as a bill about uh, protecting our fisheries. That's that's what that bill is about, and updating the Fishways Act and the Anadromous Fish Act. That bill is in the House Fisheries Committee. It was. Uh, there was a CS that was rolled out in, I think, early February. I think that uh, other tweaks and uh, changes are being considered by the Fisheries Committee Chair. And uh, if or when that bill moves out of the Fisheries Committee to the Resources Committee, given its, we think, importance because of the initiative, and we expect the Supreme Court to rule in early April on the constitutionality of that initiative, uh, that it undoubtedly would get a lot of attention and we're prepared to meet as many hours as we need to so that all parties, and I mean all parties, uh, can speak to it. <clears throat> Becky Boer with AP for Representative Tuck. Um, I believe you have supported um, putting a dividend formula in the Constitution. Do you think that needs to be part of the discussion as we're putting together, or as you all are putting together, and an end game package? Well, um, we see several different forms of constitutionalizing the permanent fund in the House and the Senate, different, different types of legislation. Uh, I think it's uh, something that needs to be discussed. Uh, this is going to be the first time in Alaska's history where we're actually going to be using the earnings reserve to pay for government. We have no other choice. We tried to avoid that last year by passing a comprehensive plan over to the Senate. The Senate only wants to do a POMV only plan. And then we hear uh, Senator Meyer saying he wants to do additional cuts. The only additional cuts is cutting the permanent fund dividend. And uh, I, I don't feel comfortable making those type of decisions without hearing from the people. And uh, so uh, in many ways, a constitutional amendment is a compact. It's an agreement between the people and the government on how it should be spent and what it should be spent on. Uh, you know, when we had uh, constituent meetings over the last couple weekends, I've been hearing that people want essential services. They want public education. They want public safety. They want their, their streets plowed. Um, it's been horrendous for Fairbanks and Anchorage in, in getting the streets cleared. Um, that's just a, a, a sign of constraint budgets. And so I think having this compact with the people saying, hey, this is the terms and conditions that we will use the earnings reserve in partnership with the people of Alaska. And that may be something that uh, we, we may want to put out to the people. Right now, we're just discussing it and seeing what the, those terms and conditions may end up being if we do get a constitution amendment. And then, of course, that takes two-thirds vote, so we're going to need uh, support from the Senate and support from the minority as well. I, I'd just like to add on to that. You know, this 
The impetus to do this is mainly coming from the inability of the Senate to consider our financial situation and diversifying our revenues. Because what we're looking at is the Senate saying, we're only going to set this system up that has no revenue, new revenue coming in, so that the only place to go to balance the budget is to either drain more money from the earning reserve or take the other half of the dividend. And that's what has been said by a number of times on the Senate side. We're not going to pass any tax until there's no uh, checks going out from the government or there's no dividend of the people's royalty money. Uh, and so that's a, a real problem. But that's the impetus behind saying, hey, if that's where the Senate's going, then if we believe in the dividend, we're probably going to have to look at ways to protect that. Otherwise, that's their method of getting towards, uh, you know, that pretty ridiculous fee of saying $2 billion of cuts. You can only start probably with that $800 million, and that's a Senate proposal, not a House proposal. And then we heard from Senator Kelly yesterday talking about how um, having a constitutional amendment enshrines a government check, and he sees that as problematic from a number of standpoints. Um, and I just want to say that uh, that is a royalty payment um, for Alaskans. It's a distribution of royalty payment. And, uh, um, you know, there's arguments about what, what the original intent of that was, but right now Alaskans do depend on it. You know, we have a lot of people who, who um, um, every year pay for their kids' school clothes. Um, we have um, people who are taking care of their prescription drugs. And uh, we're keeping people from going homeless in many cases, unfortunately. And we're in tough economic times right now. And, uh, you know, I think it's just an expression also of the frustration we've had with uh, the, the Senate. The Senate, you know, we've, we've come up with option after option after option. And now we're looking at potentially trying to do something with oil again only because we're out of options. I mean, I think it's wrong that every time we come up with an idea, um, Senator Pete Kelly, President Pete says, you know, it's just going to go in the trash can, or we're going to mockingly laugh at that. Mockingly laugh at solutions, solutions for public education, solutions for public safety. Um, you know, and so we're waiting for ideas that come from them, and, um, and I think it's just an expression of frustration there, and, and, and the public is feeling angst about this. The public did not like seeing us here to June 22nd last year. They did not like that at all, and that could have been easily prevented. And uh, so I, all I can say is that the House will have our work done in 90 days. It, depending if we're still here, we'll be on the Senate. And uh, I hope that we're going to be done. You're a good person. All right, that's a wrap up. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next week.